We are in Seattle at Sleep 2009 with Jerry Siegel, who is a sleep researcher at the VA and UCLA. Um, you're running a very interesting looking symposium on Thursday here at the sleep meeting. Um, does sleep have a universal vital function across individuals and species with uh, Amita Segal, um, Chiara Cirelli, and David Dinges? Um, but let's first of all, and, and this is connected to it, but let's first of all deal with this, this paper that you did called Do All Animals Sleep? Right. Um, I've spoken to a lot of these folks, obviously, and it doesn't seem like that would be an issue. So what was, what was, the, what was the question here? What were you getting at? It, it doesn't seem that that would be an issue to me because they all assume that all animals sleep. Yes. Well, see, it depends on uh, what you define as sleep. And uh, so... T Take, for example, the dolphin. They have slow waves in one half of the brain, but their behavior is not sleep. And particularly smaller dolphins are continuously active 24 hours a day from birth until death. They're avoiding obstacles. They're moving. And what some people have said in print is, well, this is the way they sleep, sort of sleep swimming. But uh, so... I can live with that, except that that's sort of a perversion of the common sense meaning of the word sleep. Sleep means a period of reduced activity, reduced responsiveness. And it's not a trivial distinction because if an animal is moving, we know that a whole lot of sy motor systems in the brain are active. We also know that a whole lot of sensory systems in the brain are active. So an animal that's moving and avoiding obstacles, his brain is going to be totally different from an animal that's sleeping in the way most of us would uh, define sleep, that is inactive, unresponsive. And so if you want to say there's a kind of sleep that doesn't look anything like sleep, I don't want to argue the point uh, as, a, you know, as a philosophical issue. But in, in point of fact, if we apply the criteria that are used to define sleep in Drosophila, for example, because Drosophila you can't record EEG. And so what you're looking for is unresponsiveness Activity and immobility. So it's ironic when the people who use that definition to say, yeah, the Drosophila sleeps, look, it's unresponsive, it's inactive, and it has this rebound of sleep. Well, what if you find an animal that's not unresponsive, that's active, and doesn't have a rebound of sleep when you disturb it? Do you say it doesn't sleep? Well, yeah. But instead, what the field has done is say, well, it sleeps, but it just doesn't look like sleep, doesn't act like sleep, doesn't taste like sleep. But it's, it's still sleep because there's slow waves. But slow waves aren't part of the definition. They're a secondary correlate of sleep. That's like regular breathing is a correlate of non-REM sleep. But you don't say an animal that breathes regularly is necessarily asleep. Otherwise, you know, you might be called asleep right now. You're not moving. Uh, you're breathing regularly, um, you know, who is to say? With a human, you can ask them. But when you're talking about animals, you need some objective criteria. And, you know, there's pretty universal agreement, except when you get to these strange cases, like animals that are in continuous motion, animals that uh, don't seem to suffer from loss of sleep. And often it's the same animal. Um, Un under different conditions, you can get different levels of rebound. So, I mean, so, so that's the issue. I'm not claiming that there's an animal that's definitively identified as not sleeping, although there is one pretty good report in the literature. It's not perfect, but it's that the bullfrog does not ever seem to be unresponsive. So that's one that's specifically been studied. But, but if you take the general picture and just confine yourself, say, to mammals, the bullfrog you know, being an amphibian, but if you confine yourself to mammals, there have been about 70 systematic studies of mammals out of the 4,000 or so species. I would not be very confident that you've proved that all animals sleep just because most of those 70 show sleep. In fact, about uh, a substantial percentage of them haven't been tested in terms of arousal threshold, uh, in terms of rebound, uh, which we know varies a lot from species to species. And so whatever we call it, we have to be aware that the, the behavior we call as sleep 
uh, can be very different in other animals to the point where it's indistinguishable from the behavior we call waking. So, so obviously you're not doing this just to, just to be contrarian and to irritate your colleagues. I mean, is there a, what, you, what, what are you, where are you trying to steer people with this? Well, I think the, the implication of all animals sleep, which is why I wrote the article, because I saw actually one of my colleagues saying that in the media, as, as every, every, something everyone knows that all animals sleep. The implication is that they all sleep for the same reason. That, that's unstated. Well, but your, your, your Thursday Symposium has a title uh, about universal vital function, right. sleep as a universal, right. universal vital function. Right. So universal, so universal meaning they all sleep for the same reason. Vital means that it's essential to life. And uh, if you accept that all animals sleep for the universal vital function, first of all, you have to explain why nobody's figured out what that function is. And uh, second of all, if you accept that, then there is uh, an imperative to study the simplest animals rather than study mammals. Uh, and because, you know, why study humans, rats, cats, dogs, dolphins, uh, when you can find out everything there is to, to know in Drosophila. But uh, part of my feeling that that's not the best strategy, and I'm not denying that there are a lot of things you can find out in Drosophila, uh, but their sleep state may be quite different than the sleep state we have, and they may sleep for different reasons. Um, but when you start to look at mammals, what you're struck with is the enormous variety of sleep. So, for example, one relatively uncontroversial fact is that dolphins don't have REM sleep. All other mammals have REM sleep. I mean, dolphins meaning cetaceans, dolphins and whales, that family. Uh, there's, there's no persuasive evidence for REM sleep. Again, you can say, well, they must have REM sleep, you just don't know what it looks like in them. But I do know that it doesn't have any of the classic criteria, and so it's not there. You know, there, there's no rapid eye movements, there's no respiratory irregularity, there's no twitches. Um, so if you have this huge difference between dolphins and humans, which have about the same size brain, and that's another assumption that sleep is for the brain, um, then you have to start, start thinking how much of the lessons in more remotely related animals are going to be immediately applicable to humans, which is what we're all ultimately interested in. Mm -hmm. If you have animals with and without REM sleep, you have um, rats deprived of sleep. So, so the, the idea that sleep has a vital function stems directly from Rex Schaffen's work. Uh, sleep depriving rats by this automated apparatus, the disc over water apparatus, which is, is more or less gentle and, it, and it's well controlled, uh, but it involves repeatedly waking animals up uh, and after two weeks or so, they will start dying. And of course, once that was discovered, they didn't take it to the end. But um, so when that was first published, it was big news. You know, uh, we don't know what sleep is for, but we know animals die if they don't get it. Um, so, the, so, so that would be a vital function of sleep. And we just merely have to figure out why they die and we have the function of sleep. But this was discovered 20 years ago, and really no progress has been made. I mean, that's, maybe that, that's not the most diplomatic way to put it, but we, we don't know what the vital function of sleep. There certainly is no general agreement, and the list of hypothesized functions gets longer every year, but, but there's no coalescence around any particular function. So let pick up a couple of things there. So Alan Rechschaffen does the work with the, with the rats. They're in a, they're a water, water avoidance thing. So the, the story would be that they certainly stressed, right? Yeah. So is the cause of their death stress, or is it the lack of sleep would be one question, right? Well, that, that's the question. I mean, the, the, the technique was used to minimize stress. And I think as it goes, it's, it's pretty good. But um, th there's sort of different kinds of stress, and maybe taking the word stress out, because stress is uh, linked to steroids. You can measure steroids. You can say, you know, there's no stress. But, 
but it may be the way they're awakened and the frequency with which they're awakened that uh, does something because there are other ways of depriving rats of sleep. Uh, the way that most people are using now, simply because it's easier to use than the disc over water, is to put rats on a treadmill. And so the experimental rat, the, tread, the treadmill starts on a very frequent schedule. It can be triggered by the animal going to sleep, which is the way the disc over water method is triggered by the EEG waves. But the, um, the simple way of doing a treadmill is you have one rat you know, every uh, minute the treadmill starts. So the animal can't really get to sleep because it has to start walking. Otherwise, it will fall off the treadmill or go in the water. So, uh, and the control is instead of uh, every minute and a half, uh, every 15 minutes, the treadmill starts and it goes for 15 minutes. So they, they run equal distances and, uh, you know, one is sleep deprived and the other is relatively unsleep deprived. Well, what happens to the same species when they're deprived in that way? No report of death. <clears throat> uh, the, the contrary argument would be it's not sufficiently uh, complete, you know, that you have to really completely deprive animals of sleep. But, but the other possibility is there's something about the disc over water method because lots of people are using the treadmill. No one's shown, there's no published report that I'm aware of of any rat dying on the treadmill. No matter how long it goes, no matter how great the sleep debt is. Similarly, there's no report of any mouse ever dying from any form of sleep deprivation. So this idea that it's universal is, is based on nothing. There is data that Drosophila die when they're uh, sort of vibrated when they're in a sleep state. Is that the same thing? I don't know. But, but just because there's some evidence in Drosophila and there's some, some evidence for one form of sleep deprivation in rat doesn't mean that you can now say all 5,000 species die in the same way. Another interesting thing about the, the uh, disc over water technique is there is a regular syndrome where the animal's body temperature goes high, above normal. If you give the opportunity for the animal to uh, seek a, a, a warmer environment, they will go to the warmer environment and they'll die faster. So there's something very weird about their thermoregulation that, that gets uh, screwed up <clears throat> with, uh, with the disc over water technique. And so the body temperature goes high, skin lesions develop, and then at the very end, everything just crashes and they die. Well, humans, when they're sleep deprived, they get cold. You've probably experienced this yourself. You stay up all night, you feel cold. And if you took your body temperature, it's actually low. So where is the, this universal aspect? You're going in just the opposite direction. If you were in the same direction, you could, you, you still have to investigate whether it's the same phenomenon, because obviously body temperature can only go in two directions. But in this case, it's going in the direction that rules out this very important commonality. You know, then, then you have, uh, the situation in the dolphin, which is really what started me, uh, what, what caused me to re-examine this issue. Because uh, we were interested in whether dolphins have REM sleep. As I've said, the evidence is that they don't. But, but when I've presented this at meetings in the past, people would make the very reasonable suggestion, why don't you look right after they're born? Because most animals have maximal REM sleep after birth. And so uh, there was a, a, a killer whale actually born at SeaWorld. We had done prior work at SeaWorld in San Diego. And I, I, I thought, well, this is a great opportunity. We found out the day it was born, uh, uh, Oleg Lehman, who works with me, and is a very experienced uh, uh, marine mammal researcher, went down there and started examining the animal. And I didn't see him for a few weeks while he was doing this. And he comes back and he says, Jerry, not only don't they have REM sleep, they don't have sleep at all. They've stopped you know, because large, uh, cetaceans do have th uh, behaviors that look like sleep, and maybe they are sleep. They'll, they'll just float for a while, or they'll sink to the bottom, and they appear relatively unresponsive. But see, it gets difficult when the animal can't tell you whether they're, they're asleep or not. But this behavior completely stops when they give birth, both in the mother and in the calf. And for about six weeks, they are active 24 hours a day, both the calf and the mother. Now, if you remember back what I said, if, if you deprive rats of 
sleep, for three weeks they'll all die. Here you have the, the mother and the calf going for on the order of six weeks, and then they just gradually increase back up to baseline levels. They don't have rebound, and they're constantly turning, they're swimming in formation, they have to both be alert. And in the wild, what usually happens, what I'm describing is what happens in the three million gallon pool at, at SeaWorld, but in the wild what's happening is they're migrating from the calving grounds to the feeding grounds. And that's the period that the calf is most likely to be killed, you know, because they're small enough to be, you know, uh, bite-sized for great white sharks or other killer whales, which, which can eat, eat their same species. Um, and so from, a, from a, a Darwinian point of view, it's very hard to believe that they're not alert, which is what they appear to be. I mean, if they were in a pool and they were sleeping, my understanding of what you mean by sleep is you would expect them to run into the walls. That's not happening. And they're staying in tight formation because the calf's life depends on it being near the mother because she'll defend it. And so, so here you have an animal surviving without any appreciable sleep by a behavioral definition, by any reasonable behavioral definition, for over a month. And this is just a normal part of their lifespan. Then when you look at smaller cetaceans, <clears throat> like the, the harbor porpoise or Cummerson's dolphin, uh, which is, you know, it's about that big, uh, the, the smaller dolphins, like, like the newborns, are in continuous motion, except the smaller dolphins, I'm talking about the adult being small. And so they're in continuous motion from when they're born to when they die. And so you have to reconcile this. If, if you're saying they're asleep, then you have to start saying, well, they sleep while they're swimming. And I don't buy that as, as, a, uh, you know, as a reasonable definition of sleep, because then how do you know, you know when animals are asleep, how much they're sleeping, if, if you can't judge, judge it behaviorally? It's a behavioral state. What is the story about the using half a, half a one hemisphere sleeping and so on? Well, obviously something is happening in the cortex and uh, <clears throat> there may be some recovery uh, in the cortex, although the explanation I favor is that they're able to, uh, because they swim in groups, they can shut off half of their brain and keep the half that's connected to the eye that goes to the exterior uh, and uh, the, the group provides protection and they save the energy that that half of the brain uses. Because the, 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 the energy the brain uses is considerable. At rest, the way we are now, uh, the, the brain is 2% uh, of the body weight and uses about 20% of the body's energy. So the, the, the brain uh, uses a tremendous amount of energy and the difference between active waking and quiet waking is insignificant. So, you know, if you're doing your calculus homework or, uh, you know, uh, looking at the ceiling, your brain uses about the same amount of energy. However, when you go to sleep, brain usage will decrease substantially, 30 to 40 percent. So there is a benefit to shutting down the brain if you don't need it all. We can't do that, but dolphins apparently can. And, uh, you know, so that aspect of sleep, I would say, is there. I just wouldn't call the whole behavior sleep because they're not acting like they're asleep. They're responding, they're moving, um, they're, they're well coordinated. Now, the other species I've been studying is fur seals, and they, they have a sort of a variation on this where they, they also have unihemispheric uh, EEG changes when they're in water but not when they're on land. So when they're on land, they're like dogs. They sleep bilaterally, they're like dogs, they're like rats. Everything looks like conventional sleep. When they go in the water, they sleep like dolphins. They have the unihemispheric slow waves. In that case, the, the, part, the body part opposite to the hemisphere that's showing, showing slow waves, which is the body part that it controls, is inactive. Whereas the body part connected to the, the hemisphere with the waking-like EEG is active. Specifically, they will use one flipper to maintain their position in the water. So in, in the case of fur seals, I'm prepared 
to accept this as a, a, a very strange kind of sleep where half of the brain and body appear to be asleep because they are inactive and possibly unresponsive, although that hasn't been established. But in the case of the dolphin, when they're having the unihemispheric slow waves, there is no asymmetry in their behavior. Lev Mukamatov, who's the guy who, who discovered this, uh, has said, you cannot tell if these uh, slow waves are occurring by watching the dolphin. There's no difference between when the slow waves are occurring and when they're not occurring. So, uh, you know, if there's no difference in the observable behavior between waking and this other state, I'm hard pressed to call it sleep. But, but again, the, the semantic issue isn't as important as saying what's going on in the brain. That obviously very different things are happening in the brain when you have these, this unihemispheric uh, uh, slow wave activity in, in the dolphin and in the fur seal for that matter. You, you mentioned um, the importance of energy usage here. Um, there was a recent piece in the Scientist magazine that was spoken to by uh, about Tononi and, and Turelli's um, thesis of why we sleep. I mean, the cover line is why sleep? Question, why sleep? Mm. Um, and th that's an energetic argument as well, obviously. It's, it's talking about yeah. pruning synapses and so on and so forth. To, is there any overlap at all between your, your views there? or? Uh, I guess you could say there's some uh, similarity in, in, in uh, kind of the direction it's going, uh, that, um, you know, that there's some savings going on. In that case, it's space. In my case, it's energy. But they're also saying energy sort of per unit space. And uh, I would say, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, not wanting to disagree with everyone, I'll say, <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that, that uh, th there is a connection that, you know, <laughs> When you interviewed me uh, many years ago, uh, I remember the, the video you produced. Uh, you, you, you were talking about sort of taking out the garbage that the function of uh, REM sleep was to dump the garbage. And that was from, crick. from crick. And I see this as essentially it's the same idea, just updated a bit. You know, that it's, you know, it's to, to forget stuff. Basically, that's what, what Crick said to forget stuff, and, and uh, here and I, you know, I. Um, this, of course, is very hard to reconcile with all the other literature that REM sleep is for remembering stuff, which I also disagree with. So I, I guess I'm more sympathetic to that than to this this other literature. But I think it's important for the outsider and also for people in the field to realize that these can't all be right. Uh, I mean. People can say they're all right because, you know, they're, I mean, maybe that's my role, sort of, to say they can't be all right. But, but uh, <clears throat> if you're saying you're losing synapses and someone else is saying you're solidifying synapses, I suppose you could say you're losing the ones that are unimportant and you're solidifying the other ones. But, you know, how does the brain know uh, which is happening? Um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a balancing act. But at least on the surface, they seem to be opposite ideas to me. You also disagree with the notion, I mean, there, there are many of these folks who are on record as saying that um, if you don't get sleep, eventually you die. End of story. Right. You disagree with it. <coughs> oh, you may if, want to gloss that if, a little if bit. If you don't uh, get any sleep, the amount of stress needed to prevent sleep, uh, if you're being deprived. See, I had, I had a recent interview uh, um, by a reporter from Slate who was, uh, or, or maybe it was Time Magazine, they were doing a story on Guantanamo and um, they were saying... Oh, this is war torture, waterboarding yeah, and so on? The uh, sleep deprivation, which was one of the things they did to these guys. Hmm. And they said, well, um, Jim Horn... Uh, said that you University can go... University of Leicester research right, sleep research. You, yeah. you can go without sleep for 12 days, and it doesn't seem to do anything bad to you. That wasn't Jim Horn's work, but he is correctly repeating that there have been at least two people well-documented that have gone without sleep for 12 days. And 
they were fine. They sort of enjoyed it. They enjoyed the attention. One of them was in the Guinness Book of Records. Ended right, up and the other one was baseball afterwards. Right. right, and the other one was trying to beat him. So I don't know if he's made it to the Guinness Book of World Records now. Right. And so this this reporter tells me this, and I say, <laughs> I'm sure Jim Horn would go nuts if he heard that you were using his uh, re repeating this experiment to say it's not torture. I said. The, the issue is not whether they went without sleep or not. The issue is, how did they prevent sleep? And, and I don't really know this. And I asked the reporter, well, do you know how they... Re he said, oh, yeah, they, they sort of hung them from the ceiling. They, you know, and whenever, when, whenever the head went down, they sprayed them in the face with water. Well, you know, in one case, you have a high school kid, Randy Gardner, playing basketball, talking with friends, playing chess, and going without sleep. In another case, you got some guy being cursed at, hanging from the ceiling with water sprayed in his face, who very much wants to sleep and who's, who's exhausted. You know? and, and it's obvious that these are not equivalent situations, that this guy is being tortured. And I saw a, a Jim at this meeting a couple of days ago, and of course, that's exactly what he felt, and he had already heard about it from some other source. They issued a press release. He said, this is ridiculous. But in the case of animals, you're always doing the, the hanging from the ceiling mm. uh, equivalent. These animals are not voluntary participants. Uh, they're being uh, awakened. And uh, you know, people say, well, they, they, they give them novel objects to investigate. But that doesn't keep animals awake for very long. Uh, after a while, the novel object uh, has to be uh, accompanied by a, a little bit stronger stimulation. So, you know, it's, it's the way these things are done. Now, in terms of uh, having less sleep killing you, unless you're talking about this total sleep deprivation, which has only been shown to be lethal in the rat on the disc over water technique, and in Drosophila. And I mean, I'm sorry, when you're saying that, it's not, when you say disc over water, I mean, this is a specific experimental okay. setup that, that it's, it's two animals on a disc, both of which are having the brain waves recorded. When the experimental animal's brain wave indicates that it's in sleep, the disc will start to rotate and both animals have to walk. So that wakes up the experimental animal. When the experimental, experimental animal is grooming or eating, uh, the disc is stationary and the other animal can sleep. So, so that's how you get this differential effect. In fact, they're both deprived, but one is deprived more severely. So as I said, the only animals that have been shown definitively to die from sleep are rats deprived of the disc over water technique, which, which is not the result you get depriving rats by other techniques, and, um, and Drosophila, which may be a totally different thing. The organism is so different. There's also vibration. In Drosophila, you have no way of really equating stress or uh, measuring it. <clears throat> so, um, but we do have the most relevant animal has been most thoroughly studied with respect to sleep, and that's humans. So uh, you might get the impression that uh, if you reduce sleep in humans, their lifespan is going to be uh, greatly shortened. And so there was a huge study uh, that now has been replicated by two other studies. Uh, but, th but the first study uh, polled over a million people, asked them how much they slept, in addition to a whole lot of other questions. This was done by the American Cancer Society. And then five years later, an effort was made to determine how many of these million people had died and how that correlated with the, their uh, information five years ago on how long they slept. Now you can say that's not the same as taking them to lab and measuring it, but pretty much people can tell you how much they slept. The, it's not perfectly accurate, but someone says they sleep six hours a night, someone else says they sleep nine hours a night. No question, the person who sleeps nine hours a night, if you take them to the lab, is going to sleep more than six. He may sleep eight and a half or you know, something like that. So if you do this, what you find is there's an optimal amount of sleep for lifespan, which is about seven hours. People who uh, sleep less than that have just a slightly shortened lifespan, not by much, uh, down to like four hours. And th that's sort of as, as low as it goes. But people who sleep more than seven hours have a greatly shortened lifespan. So the, the curve is a U-shaped curve which goes up much faster on the side that has more sleep. 
Now, I'm not saying that more sleep kills you, but it's quite clear from, from this data that less sleep doesn't kill you. There's just an, it's, it's a behavior. Some people get by with a, a little sleep, uh, and uh, other people need more sleep. We don't quite know what uh, the cause of that is. We don't know if we deprive people who get a lot of sleep, if, if they're gonna live longer, if you, we bring them back to the mean. We don't know whether they might have some pre-existing condition that makes them sleep more, although in this experiment, uh, they uh, <coughs> eliminated the possibility that these people have sleep apnea, which is one cause of extended sleep and also of shortened lifespan. But there, there is no evidence that I know of, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure there is just no evidence, that increasing people's uh, sleep time is, is going to increase their lifespan. Now, I, I also don't challenge that Ed Van Korter has, has data that uh, sleep-deprived kids tend to be obese, tend, are more likely to get diabetes, and you know, so, so, so sleep deprivation in this way is not necessarily good for you. But the dramatic effect that you might expect from the rats, that uh, a person sleeping half as much as another person has more or less the same lifespan or a better lifespan than the person sleeping a lot, makes you uh, reconsider this, this idea that uh, you know, sleep deprivation is going to kill you immediately. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not advocating reducing sleep. Uh, you know, you're, if you listen to your body, that's sort of the best advice anyone can get, you know, in terms of this sort of thing. But, but the idea that you have to put sleep ahead of all other uh, bodily needs, that you have to, you know, not take care of your kid or, uh, you know, do other things, quit your job if you need the money. Uh, I, I think that's a decision people can make uh, considering the trade-offs that they're aware of. But uh, I'm not prepared to tell them you must, you know, you must sleep eight hours or you'll die because there is no evidence for that. Okay, so one of the questions that we've been asking, I've been asking people is, uh, given what they know from their research and their colleagues' research, and given that sleep is intimately interconnected with diet, nutrition, metabolism, learning, the whole education system, fundamentally, um, how long kids should be in school, what time they should start school, whether playing video games and, and being in the Twitterverse is um, <laughs> affecting their attention spans and so on, so that whole gamut of things. Um, is there some advice that they would give, say, a secretary of education? Now, you're basically saying, um, I'm not saying you should necessarily uh, sleep more or sleep less. I'm just saying that the, the case is not proved. Is that, is that roughly what? Well, or what, the, what advice would the, you the, give the, the secretary? The, of the question <laughs> that that um, uh, I. I I, that I think I'm knowledgeable about is sleep across species. The question of giving advice to someone is out of, out of my sphere. Uh, you know, as a Barack Obama has said, it's above my pay grade. This is a, a decision they have to make. Um, but I do think that there are some, some things to keep in mind. If you convince people that sleep is more important than any other need, and they're not getting sleep, um, they're going to be tempted to get hypnotic medication. And uh, this is a very common situation in the United States. Millions of people, and throughout the world, millions of people are taking hypnotic medication. To some extent, I would, I would guess, although I don't you know, n know exactly what these people's motivations are, but to some extent because people think it's unhealthy not to sleep, and if they're insomniac, they should go to the doctor. And if you go to any doctor and tell them you can't sleep, and they check you for sleep apnea, and, and it's not that, they'll give you hypnotic medication. Now, in this study that Dan Kripke did in San Diego, what he found was that the more hypnotic medication you take, the sooner you will die. Not, not, it won't extend your life, but it will shorten your life by a considerable amount. Uh, now, you know, I don't know uh, whether there's any additional evidence bearing on that. I spoke to someone yesterday who, who uh, uh, wasn't finding such a relationship. But, but in this early study, it was 
a, a very large database, and the hypnotics that we used are, are pretty similar to the ones that are used today. And uh, you know, the way hypnotics are tested is they're tested for toxicity, and uh, you know, and then after they're on the market, they're tested for you know cancer and, and stuff like that. But uh, the, the the lifespan isn't something that's being tightly monitored, and. Uh, we have lots of examples of common medical therapies that turn out to be disastrous, you know. Um, and and uh, I think it's very possible that this will be one. There are ways to treat insomnia with uh, behavioral techniques and, you know, trying to remove the source of the insomnia that essentially have no downside. You know, they can only make people happier and healthier. But uh, taking hypnotic medication, uh, the, the indications, the only indications I've seen is that they're bad for you. Uh, and I imagine if there was some definitive study that showed hypnotic medications extended life, we would have heard about it. But, but there isn't such a study. Now, people are miserable and, you know, people who have insomnia will say, you know, it, you know, God bless him, you know, it's great that I can have this medication. But if you told them, you know, you're going to live four years less taking this medication, they might think, well, maybe I should, you know, keep my hours more regular, stop drinking alcohol and caffeine and, you know, adjust my life that way. So I, I think this idea that sleep loss is lethal and that sleep amount is directly correlated with health uh, has consequences in terms of how people live, even though this is a sort of a basic science issue, which is where my expertise is. But it, it has consequences for the general po population. So before I tell people, you know, you must sleep no matter what, and, and if you don't sleep, you go see your doctor and get hypnotic medication, because that's what's going to happen uh, in most cases. Now, some doctors will do this behavioral treatment, uh, fortunately. But, but um, you know, you have to consider that big picture. So, that, I mean, that's, that's why I, I, I don't, I, I think this is an important issue, the assumption that it's vital that you die if you don't get enough sleep. And uh, it's an issue with uh, public health implications. So uh, I, I can just insert, this is sort of a, a backwards, uh, I should have mentioned this earlier, but there's another study on the disc over water technique uh, done by a student of Al Rechschaffen's. So done the right way, Ruth Benka, who you may have met, she's a former president of the society. And um, so she put pigeons on the disc over water technique. Nothing happened to them. They went for like 60 days or 30 days, longer than the rats have been killed. And, and they certainly didn't die and they didn't look sick and they didn't have any of these other phenomena. What did most of these folks say when, when you, when you um, make, the, make the argument that um, that there's no definitive evidence for exactly what sleep is for and whether or not um, sleep deprivation will ultimately kill you? Well, the sleep deprivation thing, I think, I haven't had anyone uh, sort of confront me on that. Maybe on Thursday <laughs> it'll be different. But um, the, uh, the dolphin thing was very interesting. So we had a paper in Nature on this. and. Uh, uh, Two groups wrote in and essentially said, we agree with uh, Lehman et al.'s data. This is my uh, associate, who was first author. Uh, but what they don't seem to understand is that's how dolphins sleep. Don't they know that's how dolphins sleep? They swim. And, uh, you know, you just don't understand how, how, how dolphins sleep. That, you know, this was, this was the newborn dolphins, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, so, so I, I, you know, I've just been writing something now. I said, you can say that this is how dolphins sleep. It's what I said to you earlier. You can say dolphins sleep when they're moving, they're responsive, they avoid obstacles, they vocalize, and that's what we're calling sleep in dolphins. I think that's kind of a confusing way of using the word sleep, but if you want to call it that, that's fine. But it means that their brain is active, uh, unlike other animals. It means that their sensory system is active, unlike other animals, that they're responsive. And, uh, you know, most of the brain is concerned with sensory or motor systems. So I don't know why you would say they're calling it sleep, except that there are the slow waves. But, you know, slow waves are not used to define sleep in anything other than land mammals. And if you want to 
then when you see an exception to all the rules that define sleep, you start, start saying that one of the criteria for sleep is sleep, I think you're confusing the issue. It's an interesting thing that's happening in the dolphin, you know, and it, uh, but to say that because it resembles sleep is, you know, like I said to you, to you earlier, if you say regular respiration is one of the aspects of sleep and you see someone breathing regularly, uh, you say, well, you're asleep. And they say, no, I'm not. And you say, no, no, you're asleep, you know? And, and that's essentially the situation in the dolphin. Um, so, uh, well, because so you can't ask them. You can't say, you know, with, <laughs> it's like knowing what someone else is thinking, you know? I can ask you what you're thinking, and I have a, a reasonable uh, understanding of your response. You know, you might be lying to me, but, but you know, I, I, have, I, I know what it is to respond to that question, and I can I sort of identify with you. But you can't ask a dolphin if they're sleeping. Uh, all you can do is look at their behavior, and their behavior doesn't look like sleep, except for the slow waves. But, but uh, we, we knew that people slept even in the 18th century when slow waves had never been recorded. You know, the conventional definition of sleep hasn't changed. Uh, and just because we have this one correlate, carlet, we shouldn't confuse this correlate of sleep with being sleep itself. To try and find some sort of a meliorist position here, is it, could one say legitimately that this often happens when a field is in its infancy? I don't know why sleep should still be in its infancy after <laughs> all this time, but um, it could be the case. I, I mean, I hear people saying about somebody's experiments on insomnia that it's not actually insomnia, it's just short sleep. Um, th there's distinctions there, there's your uh, uh, um, different opinions with, with these other colleagues. I mean, maybe this is just early days yet? I mean. Well, I, I, you know, I think a part of it and the reason there is this proliferation of theories of sleep is that in, you know, in, in the modern era, we say it started in 1953 with the discovery of REM sleep. It's been 56 years now. And uh, still, uh, every review paper s starts with, we don't know what the function of sleep is. Well, m maybe we've been looking at the problem in the wrong way. And I think in science, that's often the case, that people will look at the problem in the wrong way. And if, if they take a different viewpoint, uh, they see why they're not getting an answer. And I think looking, uh, the, the, the approach has been that uh, sleep deprivation is lethal and we're going to find out what kills these rats. But it, it doesn't kill rats in other situations, it doesn't kill pigeons, it doesn't kill dolphins. People, when they're manic, can stay awake for long periods of time. And, uh, you know, this is, this is an illness for sure, it's not normal, but they also don't have a huge re rebound at the end. Well, how could that be? They've gone without sleep for, for a few days. Rebound meaning? Meaning, you know, th that they have to sleep it off, that they have this sleep debt to repay. And the same thing with dolphins. Uh, you know, th th these, in, in these situations, uh, things are not working the way they're supposed to. There's even a study in zebrafish that's been published. So people want to see. So, so in between humans and Drosophila, there are fish, you know, in, in sort of the phylogenetic scheme of things. And so uh, what you want to do if you're going to start uh, on a new species is you want to sh show that they really sleep according to the behavioral definition, which then gets thrown out the water, you know, th thrown out the window when uh, it, it doesn't fit with preconceptions. But uh, people at least start. So, so in the zebrafish, you find out that there are times of day when they're inactive and other times when they're active. This actually does not seem to be the case with all fish. But let's say the zebrafish are typical, which is what uh, you know, motivates this approach. So the zebrafish is inactive. If you poke the zebrafish every time it uh, becomes inactive and then leave it alone, you'll find that it'll be more inactive for a longer period of time. Ah, that sleep rebound, everybody's happy. On the other hand, this is a zebrafish on, on what's called a 12-12 schedule, that is, lights on for 12 hours, off for 12 hours. So they're active in the light the way we are. What if you turn on the light and leave it on? Well, then the zebrafish are active 24 hours a day. And you can leave it on for several days. You don't have to poke them, they're just continuously active. Then 
You switch them back to a 12-12 schedule, they haven't slept for three days, you would expect a huge sleep rebound. Nothing. They just go back to the normal amount of sleep. We, we have a similar uh, uh, f phenomenon in these fur seals. If the fur seal goes in the water, it stops having REM sleep. They can stay in the water for 30 days. Now, Al Rakshafen showed that REM sleep deprivation in the rats by the disc over water technique for that period of time would be lethal. Well, the dolphin is normally in the water for six months out of the year. So there's every reason to believe it gets very little REM sleep. Maybe it gets little amounts, but for six months of the year. So, so they haven't had REM sleep for, for, for six months, or in the case of our experiment, for a month. We bring them back up on land, put them in their, in their cage. Is there a REM sleep rebound? Nope. They go right back to the normal amount. So it's not being regulated in the way that people assume. So th there are all these exceptions to this, this sort of model that it's, it's necessary for life and that it's regulated across species. Um, so, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's these data that motivate my review and my, my attitude. And I'll admit that uh, 10 years ago, when I wrote reviews, I started in the same way. It was a great way. It's a great opening because it gets people's attention that we don't know the function of sleep. But, uh, and we don't know the function of sleep. Uh, but, but actually, there is another way of looking at it, which is, which is what, what will be talked about later in this meeting. Um, that maybe isn't, isn't quite as exciting because it doesn't predict that animals are going to die when they don't sleep, but that makes some sense from an evolutionary standpoint. You want me to tell you that? <laughs> okay, so that, so uh, my hypothesis is that sleep is itself adaptive. Now, Al Rekshafen, who who is a great friend who I've collaborated with, is a fantastic scientist. Uh, but but he, he really set the tone for the field, and he said, uh, you know, sleep is, is a mystery because uh, um, <clears throat> when you're, you're asleep, you're not earning a living, you're not taking care of the young, you're not having sex, you're not eating, you're not doing all the things that uh, perpetuate the species, y you're, uh, <coughs> you're vulnerable, and so you're subject to predation. So obviously, looked at in this way, sleep is a very maladaptive state, and he uses the word maladaptive, and many people use it. So there's a, a paradox that you have this state, and uh, that there must be some hidden benefit that explains why you have this state, because the state itself seems completely maladaptive. I think, and so, so, so that attitude is, is where I think the, the error is, because sleep is itself adaptive. And, and so the, the way to look at this is to take a wider view of, of the animal kingdom, and really of the plant and animal kingdom, that most species on this planet have dormant periods, and for many of them, that occupies most of their lifespan. So you can start with unicellular organis organisms like yeast. They can form a spore, and they can be dormant for years. And uh, there's a recent example, the record here, is that there was some yeast found in amber, uh, that was dated at 45 million years ago. The yeast was extracted, and it, it grew up, and you know, they made it into a beer. So, so y you have a 45 million year period of dormancy. That's a long sleep. That's a long sleep. And <laughs> seeds, uh, you know, I, I live in Southern California, as you do. Um, the hillside behind my house burned last year. I go down there to cut the hill this year. I think, ah, it's going to be easy. Everything is burned. You know, I won't have to pay someone to do it. And I go down there, and there's more growth than ever because all these seeds germinate only when it, it burns. And it burns every 10, 20 years. It's not a regular thing. So it's adaptive for, for plants, in this case, to time their activity when, for when conditions are ideal. And uh, it's not adaptive for a seed to sprout whether or not there's been a fire, because you need a certain pH, and, and, that, you know, and whether or not there's water. Uh, deciduous trees drop their leaves in the winter, and uh, 
nobody asks, well, why, why, don't they keep the, why didn't they lose out to, to evergreens? Well, evergreens are ad adaptive in certain places, and deciduous trees are adaptive in other places. It's adaptive for these animals over billions of years to be inactive for six months of the year. And so uh, when we, we think we sleep at night, that's maladaptive. It's not maladaptive. It's, it's the safe thing to do because we're adapted to particular uh, environments. First of all, mammals hibernate. When they hibernate, they will be inactive for, for uh, f several months. And a hibernating animal is very difficult to arouse. It can take an hour for it to com come completely out of hibernation. Does anybody say, well, hibernation must be doing something really vital because these animals are so vulnerable? Well, they, they, they're, they're hibernating in a safe place. And I'm sure some animals are killed while they're hibernating, but on balance, it saves energy and it keeps them from being active at times that are maladaptive. And uh, that is a, a general situation. In fact, there's very little evidence that any animal is more vulnerable when it's asleep than it's awake. Uh, because most animals have safe sleeping sites. You, you know, take humans for an example. More people, I, I'm sure this is true, although I don't have a, it's not something people keep s simple statistics on, but I'm sure many more people are killed who are out doing things at four in the morning than are in bed, no matter where they're in bed. Uh, it, it's, it's a safe place to be. We find safe places. This is how we evolve. We sleep with our family or, you know, uh, plus, we are quite responsive compared to a hibernating animal. We know when someone enters the room and, and they're a stranger. I mean, someone can tiptoe up on you because your eyes are closed, but the, the brain is pretty good at, at analyzing things while you're asleep. You know, you, the, the classic example is you know, parents wake up when they hear their baby cry, but they'll sleep through a thunderstorm. Your brain is uh, protecting you. you. Your responsiveness is reduced, but then you're in a safer situation. And uh, if you look at animals other than humans, you can see the same phenomenon. So the animal that sleeps the most of any animal that has so far been studied is the big brown bat. The, the big brown bat has been shown to sleep 20 hours a day. Now, one, one way of approaching this is to say, this animal may, must really need a lot of sleep. It, it, uh, Maybe it's, you know, it's a, it's a deep thinker, or uh, maybe it has some physiological need. It needs a lot of recovery time. Uh, but there's another way of looking at it. The big brown bat eats moths and mosquitoes. I if you've ever gone camping, you know the moths come out at about dusk, you know, 7, 8 p.m. And by midnight, they're all gone. They go back to their nests. So there really is only a, a four or five hour window in which the prey that these animals are specialized to hunt I is available. They hunt ultrasonically. Bats don't fly very well, but they do pretty well at, at, in the dark and they, they can localize these prey. Now, you know, so not surprisingly, these bats that eat the moths come out of their caves about the same time moths come out. They, they come out at dusk, they eat you know, the, their requisite number of, of flies. And then when the uh, flies go back to their nests, the, the uh, bats go back to the cave and hang from the ceiling. Now, what would happen if they were awake more? Well, if they came out a little earlier, first of all, there wouldn't be as many uh, flies to eat. There wouldn't be as many moths to eat. But what there would be is predatory birds that see a lot better than they do and fly a lot better than they do. There'd be hawks, there'd be falcons, and uh, those animals that came out a little earlier would not leave their genetic material to the next generation. On the other hand, what if they stayed out a little later while it was still dark? Well, then you wouldn't have the predators, but you wouldn't have the prey. So they'd just be wasting energy. They might get injured. They certainly wouldn't compete well with the, the, the bats that stop flying when the insects were gone. And so I, I, it seems to me that it's obvious that the reason they sleep for 20 hours a day is because it's good for them to sleep. It would be disadvantageous for them to be awake more. And this situation isn't unique. If you take the elephant, which is on the other side of the scale, they sleep relatively little. They sleep maybe five hours a day. Well, there's a recent study that shows that elephants are eating 75% of the time they're awake. If 
the elephants slept more, they would eat less, they would lose weight, they would be a different species. Again, this is the niche they've decided. And, and because they're in the open, and there are some predators, although they're not, they're not heavily preyed upon, uh, it's not adaptive for them to sleep very deeply. Um, and so they don't sleep very deeply, although this is a, a sort of a cross-species comparison that's difficult to make and hasn't really been done. But my prediction would be that a, a bat sleeps more deeply than an elephant because they're very safe. They're, you know, they're inaccessible to predators. And, and in general, I, I would predict, and, and, and this is also sort of based on common sense, that species that sleep a lot actually sleep more deeply by most criteria. So you have an animal like a giraffe, which is a frequent prey animal, and that also sleeps very little, two or three hours a day. Um, if the giraffe made up for the, the, the short amount of sleep it had by sleeping very deeply, by just being completely dead to the world, they would be dead, period, because the predators would certainly know that and they would go after the sleeping giraffes. So, so giraffes, not only do they sleep very little, but they don't sleep very deeply. And on the other side of the scale, I work with the platypus. They sleep underground, they sleep very deeply, and they sleep all the time. You can practically pick one up, except they have this stinger that's <laughs> very dangerous. But, but uh, you know, in, in the same way as within, within humans, you have this relationship where, you know, teenagers that sleep a lot are also real hard to wake up. You know, I have two that slept through the last earthquake. Uh, you know, elderly people who don't sleep very much also tend not to sleep very deeply. So there isn't this equivalence where you get m deeper sleep because you get less of it. There's this huge range where some animals sleep deeply for 20 hours a day and others never sleep deeply for two hours a day. So where is the, you know, sort of the universal principle? Well, it, suppose we buy, I mean, which is a nice argument, the, the, the adaptive ecological argument. Um, is it then not still appropriate to ask you, okay, what is the function of the elephant's sleep or the big brown bat's sleep? Is it restorative? Is it pruning synapses? Is it, so it's, isn't... Well, I think, uh, I think things can still be going on during sleep. Uh, that, uh, first of all, there's an energy savings. And so, so, so this is what we know. There is an energy savings from going to sleep relative to being in quiet waking. Uh, I mean, that's just well established from, from studies in humans, m metabolic studies. So, so you have these two savings that explain sleep time and, and sleep depth. Now, there may very well be other things going on in sleep. Uh, in humans, for example, we know growth hormone is released in uh, non-REM sleep. And uh, it's been speculated that kids that are abused, you know, sort of failure to thrive, that are living in, in environments that don't allow them to sleep normally, are shorter because they don't get enough growth hormone. So there's, there's possible function for sleep in humans. However, growth hormone is not released during sleep in dogs or rats. There are species differences. And I think you need to look at the particular species and the neurochemistry and so on. Melatonin, people take melatonin as a sleeping pill, melatonin is maximal at night, uh, but in rats, it's also maximal at night and it's when they're awake. So, so, so uh, many of the components of sleep that we think are grouped together, that are grouped together in humans, are different in different species. So I, I do think that things are going on during sleep, but, but my point is that sleep is adaptive and that sleep time is primarily determined by ecological considerations. And, and uh, evolution has produced animals that only sleep two or three hours a day and other animals that sleep 20 hours a day. And uh, within that time period, definitely things are going on. You know, you're digesting food while you're asleep. You're resting your muscles while you're asleep. There's no uh, controversy there. Your, your, your me metabolism changes. Uh, the question is, is there this vital universal function? And you know, that's, that's where the issue arises. But lots of things are going on in sleep. Certainly lots of things can probably be done better in sleep than in waking. Um, you know, but this is not the same as saying that's the function of sleep. If, you, if your fingernails grow more rapidly in sleep, you don't say, well, okay, you know, that's the function of sleep is to grow your fingernails. You're making the, a very good point here, which is obviously that um, in evolutionary terms, uh, for your big brown bat, for example, um, the, the, 
the inclusive fitness gig that it's been prescribed is get out there at eight, knock off at midnight, that's all you need to do. That's, that's when you work. Rest of the time, you don't need to be out there, sleep. Um, and different stories for different species. Right. So your conclusion for the review paper you're working on now would be? So, so my conclusion is that you can't examine sleep in isolation from other things that animals do. You can't examine it independently of the weather, for example. We know that some animals sleep less in the winter if food is not, uh, sleep more in the winter if food is not available. Other animals will sleep less when they're hungry if food is available, so they'll go around and, and hunt it. Uh, it it's, it's important to consider what the animal is specialized to do. If an animal is a herbivore like an elephant and it has to be eating uh, 15 hours a day, 16 hours a day, it can't be sleeping 12 hours a day. It just doesn't add up. And if it slept 12 hours a day, it would be a different animal. It would occupy a different ecological niche. And so uh, that's the perspective that's been missing. It's not enough to just study sleep. You have to study waking behavior, and you have to study it in a natural environment. Most of the studies of sleep of different animals that, that find these widely disparate numbers are of animals in zoos or in laboratories where the environment is totally artificial. But we need to know what happens over the 12 month uh, year, what happens night and dark, what happens when it's cold, when it's hot. That's how animals evolved, that's how sleep evolved. And uh, you can be sure that the sleep will do the adaptive thing. You're not gonna be sleeping out in the rain. You're gonna be sleeping somewhere where it's dry. Uh, you're not gonna be going out. Animals that, that uh, uh, don't evolve to be uh, quiet when there is no food are going to starve to death. They're, they're not going to, you know, it's not adaptive for an animal to go looking for food when there's no food around, uh, and they have to make that determination. But in certain seasons, there's going to be no food around. And we see elephants sleep more in the winter, reindeer sleep more in the winter. These sorts of studies haven't been done on many animals, but I, I think that this is what needs to be done. And uh, certainly, I, I think sleep time is, is going to be shown to be related to these waking parameters. It has to be, uh, which is not to say that other interesting things may not happen in sleep. But the huge range of sleep time uh, seems to be ecologically determined, and uh, it shows that sleep itself is, is quite flexible across species. Now, none of this says that we can deprive ourselves of sleep and it has no effect on health. This is a statement of how sleep evolved and, and why it has certain different amounts in different species. Uh, what happens when, when we sleep deprive ourselves, that is really for prospective studies that haven't been done. And uh, undoubtedly, uh, sleep depriving isn't going to be good for your health. But when you want the big picture, when you want to d determine why some animals sleep 20 hours a day and why some animals three, sleep three hours a day, uh, I, I think the answer is going to be in their environment, in what they do in waking, and how they evolve, and how they respond to temperature changes, light changes, and so on. The sense that um, we should be using more time, uh, more efficiently, getting more into the day and so on, that, that has to be a quintessentially human enterprise, right? I mean, you don't see committees of chimps sitting around saying we're just we're not doing enough here I mean we've got to get organized here right. and, and uh, you know it's yeah so we're we're completely detached from the natural world which is which is what our species does but we shouldn't look at other species as if they're in the same situation you know even even when we put them in that situation so we see animals in the zoo they're evolved to be uh, active 12 hours a day and you know they're sitting around throwing people, throwing things at people coming by the cage. You know chimps will do that, but in the wild they're going to be spending that time finding things. And you know, and even in the zoo we find lots of animals that are, are evolved to sleep most of the time, where they sleep all of the day and they're awake at night. Animals are going to have evolved. You know, few things are more essential to an animal's genetic survival than the amount of time it spends awake and what hours of the day it is awake and how this changes seasonally. Do you have any, um, you, you have children, right? So do you have any house rules for, for their sleep hygiene? <laughs> well, 
well, you know, Dave Dinges has this uh, 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 classification of people as type 1, type 3, that is some people uh, withstand sleep deprivation very badly and other people seem to go on just fine. So uh, m in my family, uh, people are all over the spectrum, although I guess I'm the one who suffers most from sleep loss. And I see my wife and my daughter uh, staying up for long periods of time, no problem. If there's something to do and they have to work through the night, it's no big problem. For me, that's absolute torture. And it's dangerous, too, if I'm driving at night. But for them, it's, it's very different. So I've given up. I, and and I, I guess I could say that this is a, a little bit from my background that I realized that people are different and that's that's part of evolution too you know that that uh, different individual animals are going to be different in how much sleep they need because that's nature's experiment to adjust sleep time to uh, you know to see whether it helps or hurts an animal uh, in mice different strains of mice have different amounts of sleep substantial differences and and humans th there are these huge differences it doesn't seem to be related to intelligence. People who sleep more are not smarter. It, the amount of REM sleep doesn't seem to be related to intelligence. It doesn't seem to be related to longevity, except, as I explained to you, that people who sleep a lot have, have substantially shortened lifespan compared to people who, who sleep a little. So, you know, uh, there is this diversity, like there is in height and weight and eye color and all, all these things, and there's a range that, that people can tolerate, and, uh, you know, we're part of the, the great experiment of uh, adjusting sleep time. I will say one thing that's interesting is that when you compare s human sleep to other omnivores, and we've done a study showing that predators sleep more than omnivores sl sleep more than herbivores, uh, humans are, are close to the bottom at omnivores. That is, they, they sleep very little. And so I, I do think that over the past 10,000 years, we have evolved to be awake more because, you know, we want to write more papers and write more grants, or the caveman equivalent of that. You know, we want to paint, paint that new portrait on the wall, you know, in, in, in this cave in France that maybe someone will see in, you know, in 4,000 years. And, and so, uh, you know, so, so this is just one of the many uh, variants of uh, evolution sleep time. Gary Siegel, thanks very much.